Good morning, or actually it's afternoon. It's right past noon right now, and I'm trying to get this video made for you guys, um, a little lunchtime reading. It actually is lunchtime here. I am cooking up some rice. I'm gonna have, I made some peanut sauce after, <clears throat> sorry, for dinner this week, and so I'm gonna heat up some rice and have some peanut sauce over it. That's gonna be my lunch. Uh, you guys, you know what you should do today? You should get on Marco Polo and tell me what you had for lunch. I would love to know what you guys had for lunch as I think about you at school and how I'd walk by and check out your lunches. It'd be fun to hear what you're having at home. All right, we left off with uh, Brother Luke teaching Robin how to swim and he, Robin's getting stronger and stronger and, and um, not only that, Brother Luke has taught him how to read and write. Remember, he wrote a letter to his father. And, um, and so uh, we also left off, I think yesterday, with the exciting challenge um, that Brother Luke presented to Robin about making crutches now. That was his next assignment, was to make crutches. Okay. All right, so one Friday toward the end of September, the monks of the choir stood practicing in the chapel, standing by the lectern to turn the pages of the music book was Robin in scarlet cassock and white linen cotta. That's the, what he was wearing, the color. They were singing the Sanctus. Remember the Sanctus? We know the Sanctus from our Latin. They were singing it and had just come to the Amen when a church official, which is called a verger, appeared. He held up his hand for their attention. A messenger has come for young Robin from his father, he said. Let him come with me. Robin followed the official down the corridor to the parlor the thud of his crutches alternating with the sound of his soft shoes on the stone floor. Robin wondered who the messenger could be. Well, it was John Go in the Wind. Remember him? The minstrel. He's the one who had carried Robin's letter to his father weeks ago. Good young master, he said to Robin. This letter I bring from thy noble father in all haste. For a long time, <clears throat> I could not find him. For the battle did go first to one place, then to another, and the Scots from Scotland to, were so fierce in fighting that often the battle went against our side. Remember, they're from England and they're fighting the Scottish. And how goes it now, asked Robin. Is my father alive? Is he well and safe? It goes well now, said John, and here is thy letter. Thank you, John Go on the Wind, said Robin. Then he took the letter to the light to read it. His hands shook, for it was the first word he had heard from his father since early winter. The first letter, so that was almost a year ago. <clears throat> this was the first letter he had ever received indeed, and it was exciting to know now that he could read it for himself, right? Thanks to Brother Luke. And here's what the letter said. Robin, son of John de Bureford, from his father. Greeting, it grieves me, my son, more than I can tell you to know that you are ill. I thank heaven it is not the plague you have had, for that enemy has slain more men than battle. Besides the women and children it has taken toll of, it shocked me to learn that you had been left to the care of strangers your mother would hardly bear it if I should tell her, but I will not. She is with the queen who is in delicate health. I dare not say where, lest this letter should fall into unfriendly hands. <clears throat> she supposes that you are far away from London in Shropshire, in Shropshire. It is well, let her continue to think so, for in truth, you soon will be. God willing and your health permitting, for I have requested the prior to arrange your journey with all speed. You will travel in care of Brother Luke and John go in the wind. 
I had a message from Sir Peter only the day before your letter reached me asking what had happened to you. Because remember, he was supposed to go to Sir Peter's castle, place. That's where he was going to learn to become a knight. <clears throat> and so his father said, I had a message from Sir Peter only the day before your letter reached me asking what had happened to you. For John the Fletcher never returned. Some evil befell him surely, for he was an honorable servant. Sir Peter was wounded while bringing up forces to my aid, so sorely wounded that he has been taken to a castle nearby where he will stay until he is able to be taken home. The Scots are being slowly pushed back and we are gaining ground since receiving the added help from London and the nearby towns. The king hopes for peace by Christmas, but the Scots are a stubborn race. I trust that you are improving in health, my son, and in God's grace. So farewell, your father, Sir John de Buford, Thursday after the feast of John the Baptist. Well, that was the date. Preparations for Robin's departure began immediately. Remember, that's what his father said in the letter, that he has requested for Robin to leave and to join Peter at his castle, at his home, Sir Peter. That's where he was supposed to be. And so he is asking that Robin go with uh, Brother Luke and John in the Wind for them to take them to Sir Peter's castle. So preparations for Robin's departure began immediately. Brother Luke and Brother Matthew between them, devised a sort of chair saddle in which Robin could ride. Part of it was to be made of iron, then it was to be finished with padding and leather at the saddlers. John Go in the Wind helped Brother Luke lay out a plan of travel. Brother Andrew took Brother Luke's place as cook's helper, and the prior gave orders for certain foods to be put aside for the journey. When all was ready, saddlebags were filled with clothing on one side and food on the other. There were loaves fresh from the oven, a great, <clears throat> sorry, a great slab of bacon, cheese, some dried herring, fruits from the garden, and last of all, a pasty was set in on the top. In it were larks and a rabbit seasoned with herbs and colored yellow with saffron. The fruits were apples and pears and plums, which Brother Michael had picked from the trees and vines. On the morning they set out, the air was crisp and cool. The sun had not risen above the horizon, but it cast a bright glow into the heavens, promising a fair day. <clears throat> Larks, which are birds, rose from the meadow straight up as if from pure joy, and they sang, Robin thought, as if it had been the first day of the world. He felt sorry to leave Brother Matthew and all the others who had been so good to him, but it was so exciting to start out on the long journey. There are over a hundred English miles to go, said John Go in the Wind, and frost is not far off. That means winter is not far off. So we must go steadily. He and Brother Luke shared Bayard. Remember, Bayard is the horse, taking turns, one riding, the other walking beside Robin. They went toward the Oxford Road, then turned westward through Holbur Holborn, stopping a moment to, to pray at each wayside cross, just as if they had been on a pilgrimage. It is indeed a sort of pilgrimage, said Brother Luke, for always we shall set forth for the honor of God and in the hope that young Robin will be even stronger at the end of our journey than he is now. Because it was a market day, the road was crowded with people and animals going toward London. For long, no one had been allowed to come into the city because of the plague. But now that the danger was over, people came from everywhere to exchange goods. Some rode in carts piled high with produce, cabbages and bags of grain, cheese, butter and bacon, chickens and ducks. Some drove flocks of goats and sheep or led pigs. By noon, the promise of sunshine failed. 
and the travelers took refuge from a sudden shower under a spreading beech tree. They were joined by a minstrel who was glad to share their bread and cheese and pay for his entertainment by singing a song, which John Go and the Wind picked out on the harp. Brother Michael's pears and grapes are a welcome treat to my thirsty throat, said John. It seems a week since we last ate just this morning, said Robin, eating hungrily. We've come a goodly way since early morning, said John, but we must not linger or we shall not reach the white swan by nightfall. They were, that's where they were headed, was for a, a place to stay called the white swan by night. If my father were with us, we should have no fear of anyone, said Robin. We shall have faith in the father of us all, said the friar. Of course, we know who that is. We shall have faith in God, who's the father of us all. He's right. It was, brothers Luke, it was Brother Luke's turn to ride, so jo John Go in the wind walked beside Robin. As he strode along, he began to sing, playing the tune on his harp. The tune was lively and well-measured. Bayard, the horse, stepped up his pace. The jennet, who now remember the jennet, is a small horse, pranced and arched her neck, and Robin wanted to get down and swing along with the others. Lend me a hand, John Go in the Wind, and set the crutches so I may walk a while, he directed, interrupting the song. Brother Luke looked back to see what was delaying them, but nodded as he saw Robin afoot and John again plucking the strings of the little harp. They hummed as if they had been voices, so that Robin's fingers itched to touch them. He wanted to play that, that the harp sounded like voices, and, he, and Robin had wished he could play it. Remember, Robin can walk now because he has crutches. So he's, t he's actually off the horse right now and he's walking with his crutches. Robin watched John's fingers as they searched out the tune, how they danced on the strings to make the differing chords. He noticed the smooth wood of the harp and how the strings were held with wooden pegs. He wished he could play on it and wondered if he could make such an instrument. Now that noon was past, there were a few people on the road, but soon they fell in with a peasant with a shepherd's crook over his shoulder. They asked the way to the next village. Okay, I'm thinking I'm going to stop right there. Uh, and so here they are walking towards the white swan. And they're, um, but now somebody has joined them, a peasant, and he's walking with them. And they asked him what... Um, they asked him how far it was till the next village. So that's where we're gonna stop. Let me put a little marker there. Okay, you guys, thanks for waiting for this and I hope that you enjoy it for lunch and that you also will film what you're eating. Um, if you've not joined Marco Polo, uh, Mrs. Rosenberg is the one who uh, helped get people set up on that. So have your mom email Mrs. Rosenberg and she can get you set up on it. But It'd be great for you to show me what you're eating for lunch today. All right, you guys have a great weekend and thanks for studying so hard this week.